area of understanding is in, is in nutrition, and I really want to talk a little bit about fasting and nutrition. Um, so some of the benefits of fasting that we know of, uh, for first and foremost, of course, is weight loss, particularly in that midsection area is the area that we find the best weight loss comes from there because that's where uh, we start to see more insulin sensitivity. So people that are having blood glucose issues, diabetes, maybe they're pre-diabetic, they're not quite there yet, that visceral fat, when it gets lost, is really good um, for helping keep your blood sugars in normal range. Fasting also stimulates uh, human growth hormone. So even at an older age, one can still be producing that growth hormone, and by fasting, even if you're doing inter what's called intermittent fasting, which is just you know finishing dinner around seven, and then skipping breakfast and maybe going all the way to 10, so you're getting a good um, maybe 15 hour, 14, 15 hour break, even that will help stimulate this human growth hormone. As I mentioned, it helps with insulin sensitivity, so for diabetes. Uh, ghrelin, does anybody, has anybody heard of this hormone, ghrelin? It's the hunger hormone. So we produce this hormone when we're, and then we start to feel very hungry. Now, interestingly enough, so if you sleep enough, you get the other hormone, which is called leptin. So when people don't sleep enough, sometimes they have too much production of this ghrelin and not enough of that suppressing, satiety-inducing hormone called leptin. And so sometimes people that don't rest enough, if they can just start getting good sleep at night, they can help, they can even lose some weight. So this hormone, um, the other thing I want to mention about this, sometimes people eat a very low-calorie diet to try and lose weight. That might initially help them lose weight, but it doesn't really last because this hormone continues to stay high. Um, which makes you it difficult to <coughs> feel hungry all the time. But fasting is, um, suppresses it. So it lowers triglycerides. This again is the kind of um, lipid in our blood that we don't want too much of when we eat a lot of high carbohydrates or sugary foods. We get a lot of high triglycerides. So when you, you um, start the fast, you'll find out triglycerides go down, the bad cholesterol goes down, and the good cholesterol, you must have heard of HDL and LDL, the good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So the good cholesterol stays okay, like it doesn't, it remains untouched, and the bad cholesterol goes down. And then studies in animals right now, they haven't done it in humans yet, have shown that it's slowing down aging. So we know that it's wonderful for us. Some of the impacts of fasting. Okay. So I put a passage in here just to, just to highlight maybe who should be fasting and that even in the Quran it does state that some people may not, it may not be suitable for them if they have, for instance, unregulated diabetes and their blood sugars are really out of control. That's not necessarily the best candidate and in the Quran it does say that um, it should be for really for people who can, who can handle, handle it uh, medically. So in the beginning, the first eight hours of your fast will be burning off glucose, the sugar, you know, the carbohydrate that you eat. Um, and then after that, it'll resort to uh, what's called glycogen, which is the stored glucose. That's stored in our muscles and liver. So it starts to come out of the liver, and it sometimes takes a full one or two days for it to completely deplete, but it starts to burn off fat and then it goes into burning off the fat. Okay, so it breaks down the fat into what's called ketones. Maybe you've heard of the popular diet of this ketogenic diet now, so many people are doing. Well, what it's doing is it's the same thing I was telling you about the intermittent fasting. You stop dinner, you skip breakfast, so now you're getting this big break, and you're now burning the fat, and the fat is breaking down into what's called ketones for your brain, so your brain can keep getting fuel, okay? All right. So again, I wanted to point out some of the risks when someone isn't having regulated blood sugar that they should keep in mind, uh, hypoglycemia, 
which is the shaking, sweating. These are some of the symptoms that might be experienced. Blurred vision, um, tingling of the lips, uh, feeling that irritability, and you know, heart is racing. This can be a symptom. So again, if one is um, going to do the fast and their blood sugars are not in control, it's really important to seek your um, healthcare provider's um, input and also to have them adjust medications that may need to be adjusted. If one is, do, is uh, having high blood sugar and they're taking medications, they may need less of it when they're fasting. Okay, this was a passage I saw because you know, I have to preemptively tell you when I first found out, like last week I came to do this talk over in San Ramon and my friend Nadia Ann had invited me, but she was telling me, oh, the, my, my biggest concern is that after we break our fast, so many of us are eating pakoras and samosas and spring rolls and um, some people are even gaining weight during this time and I would just love for you to talk about you know how we can avoid some of that and get the benefits so I found some of the passages the most that I could that are very supportive in the Quran about uh, healthy eating so eat what is lawful and wholesome of the on the earth okay what does that mean Maybe I can ask you, does anybody want to share what do they think is wholesome of the earth? Vegetables, huh? Yes, whole grains. Anything else? Okay, yes. Help vegetables, fruits, whole grains. Okay, so eating during Ramadan. So I told you all these amazing benefits that are coming from fasting. And the last one, I didn't even mention this one before I move on. There's, I don't know if you've heard this term hormesis. Has anybody heard this word hormesis? Hormesis is a term for the kind of, the good stress that we put on our body. So there's many kinds of hormesis. Fasting is one. Um, cold therapy, sometimes people do this and they, they heat the body up and then they go into a cold ice bath or they take a hot shower and then they switch to cold and shiver. So this whole thing, it seems like who would want to do that? Well, that kind of stress that we put on the body produces good things too. It's making the body hardy. Um, sauna, using the sauna is one thing also. So when we're going through all this beautiful effort of fasting and it's deeply spiritual, I realize that but there's a very strong health component that's coming with it, almost like a reboot. So think, think before putting the food in that body. What, what was it designed for? What kind of food? So the first thing you want to think about is electrolyte replacement. And when you think of that, you're thinking of what kind of foods would be nourishing for my body after having no liquid and no food. Probably something with some salt in it. Um, something that has a lot of minerals. Uh, one of the things I was thinking of, uh, like dates, for instance, is a good way to break the fast. Uh, dates have some protein, they have a little bit of, they have some fiber, they have some, gluc they're gonna, it's going to break down pretty quickly into sugar, which is what you need initially. And it has these minerals and electrolytes in it. Celery is another good vegetable. It's, if you know it has a slightly salty taste to it. So celery is a good electrolyte replacement. So what does that do? That helps the body hold on to water. And we want the body to hold on to water so that we can last. And other, other vegetables, they're all filled with good um, electrolytes. So uh, maybe a soup made with some celery, some tomatoes, uh, vegetables, lettuce. This is all very good to break the fast olives, bananas, and coconut water. Do any of you know that coconut water is a good electrolyte? Have you heard of that? Yeah. You can use coconut water um, to rehydrate um, after being dehydrated. Okay. So complex carbohydrates. Does anybody know what I mean by complex carbohydrate? Slow, slow digesting. Yes, slow digesting carbohydrates. So whole grains. That would not be white flour or white bread or white pasta so much as it would be maybe whole wheat 
or bulgur or um, um, or uh, quinoa or um, you know these other whole grains the, use those even if you're making something from flour make it whole wheat fiber rich foods so foods that have a lot of like vegetables beans whole grains plant foods have a lot of fiber okay uh, and then to do moder to have moderation with dates and honey. Yes, it's definitely mentioned in the Quran. It's supposed to be very healthy for you in the beginning to break fast with dates and to have them. But they are still filled with a lot of sugar. So you want to make sure that have it for that fast break, but then pace yourself so that it's not raising the blood sugar from very low to really high. And then choosing healthy cooking methods. So, what would be a healthy cooking method that you know of? Hmm? Baking. Uh, olive oil. Olive oil, using, so it's a healthy oil to use. But instead of deep fry, maybe shallow fry. You know, like falafel doesn't absorb as much as, say, deep fried uh, puri or a samosa or something, right? A little bit of that is fun and, and okay, but choosing healthy cooking methods and you'll absorb the right oils. And especially if you are deep frying, that same oil shouldn't be used again because that starts to become, it starts to fractionate and it's not healthy then at all. So use yeah. fresh. Can you stress on that point again? Because yeah. That's something that we've been doing it for years and years. And using, we're using the same oil? Using the oil so yeah, so it does. It, it um, The oil quality breaks, it breaks down and so now you're refrying in an oil that's a poor quality oil by the time it's been already heated up and used once before. <laughs> and so, and the kind of oil I would recommend, so for um, high temperature cooking, coconut oil is good and ghee is good. I don't know why it's gotten such a bad rap as being, you know, saturated fat and, you know, but it's a real food. It's a recognizable food. Um, low heat uh, frying or cooking or salad um, salad dressings, I would use olive oil. You can use for salads more extra virgin olive oil, but for cooking, light, low temperature. Don't do high temperature because again, the, it has a low smoke point, so it breaks down. Canola, the problem with canola, even though it's good for high temperature cooking, is you should try and find organic because it's a seed oil, it's not as, high not a, as good quality oil. Avocado oil, again, is good for the low temperature or salad dressing type of thing. Yeah, but I would say for frying, it would be coconut oil and um, cake. So any oil that has gone beyond the smoking point should you, never be reduced. No, it's already breaking down and it's, it's, so it's yeah, it's not healthy, yeah. I have a question on the, um, the key part. That yeah. is my favorite, but I avoid it because I feel I have a fear that I might cook it. So is it like uh, you can use key throughout your cooking and all your... You can use ghee, but again, we're, we're talking, you know, you're using moderation. So for instance, if you're cooking, um, again, we're not talking about deep fat frying, right? We're talking about, say you're making a sabzi, right? Yeah, so you're pu putting some ghee in there and you're frying your food. You're not putting this thick a layer, you're putting some, couple of tablespoons. Yes, yes, it's good. It has something in it called butyric acid, which is actually very good for the gut. And in Ayurveda, uh, you know, traditional Indian medicine has been used for just thousands of years. It's even medicinally used. And there are two words, like a cow and something. So which one you recommend? Uh, the ghee? Cow, yeah. I only know of it from dairy, from cow. I don't know about... Yeah, and oh, and the butter that I would recommend in this country would be Kerry Gold, which is from Ireland. It's a grass-fed butter. It has a nice golden color, and yeah. in Ireland, they just don't seem to be doing what we're doing here with, with the butter. <laughs> um, it doesn't say organic on it. However, it is the only grass-fed butter I have found, and Trader Joe's is the most economical place to get it. Okay. So some of the food choices. I loved this plate. I went to a conference um, a couple weeks ago called um, Mind, Mood, and Food. And it was put on by this, the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. And they shared this plate because we see a lot of, you know, plates where they show you how to divide up the food, 
half the plate should be filled with fruits and vegetables, the other quarter of the plate should have meat or a protein source, beans, and then the other quarter should have your carbohydrates, the grains, whole grains. But here you can see that fish is very, <clears throat> very good. Um, and, you know, eggs, very good for you too. The yolk, particularly do not throw out the yolk because that has what's called choline and it has retinol, which is good for your eyes. It's vitamin A source. So these are all brain foods, okay? Lots of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, olives. And drink lots of water. That should be the beverage of choice. Yeah. Hi. Um, just a quick question on the fish. Um, what fish you recommend that has the lowest amount? Mercury. So there's an acronym, SMASH. Uh, salmon, mackerel, anchovy, sardines, and herring. Yeah, SMASH. Yeah, wild salmon. Very high in omega-3. So this is a highest for your brain, brain food. Yeah? So this is, not that we're going to go into depth about um, the microbiome, but you might be hearing so much in the news about the microbiome. Um, so I'll just touch upon it. You know, there's two to four pounds of of what we call the microbiome. It's not just bacteria. It's protozoas and yeast, and there's just a variety of species there. And you kind of kind of think of it like a garden growing, but there's so much of it. There's actually more DNA of these species than our own human DNA going on in our body. If you think about that, they're completely outnumbering us ten to one. So, and we have a symbiotic relationship with them. These, uh, what? these bugs, you can call them, but they're good bugs. So what they want is they want fiber-rich food. They want fermented foods. Um, and I know in, in this, I don't know necessarily, of, uh, at least in Indian traditional, uh, every culture has some fermented food. So Korean may have kimchi, uh, Germans have sauerkraut, uh, Japanese have miso, and we have yogurt, right? Um, so these foods are very, very nourishing for the gut. Um, but w and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because we're talking about brain and feeling good, right? Emotions, we want to feel good. In the gut, we are creating 90% of our serotonin. And serotonin is that neurotransmitter that makes you feel very happy and good. And we thought that that was going on in the brain. And now, after recent, recently, a few years ago, they've realized that 90% of it is being produced in the gut and going up but through that gut-brain connection, okay? So that's why it's important to feed these, um, to feed the microbiome proper food. And then you want to eliminate processed foods. You want to eliminate these refined carbohydrates like white flour, dough, you know, white things, white um, food and omega-6 oils. So these are, particularly the, the worst ones are soybean oil and cottonseed oil. So sometimes I see that, you know, Costco has wonderful pre-made salads and it's tempting. They're fine, but the packet of salad dressing that goes with it always seems to have soybean oil in it, so I don't use those at all. So try and be picky, you know, when you're making a salad dressing, is not that hard, you can use olive oil a little balsamic, a little honey, and a little mustard, and mix it up, and that's a nice dressing. So make your own, you're worth the time to put good food in your body. Don't, don't go for these kind of foods. And a lot of packaged foods, you'll see on the back, a lot of times there's soybean oil and, and cotton seed oils, so just don't eat those. <clears throat> okay, so I found, um, so I, I did get some help for this. Uh, I had a, there was a presentation and I listened to a woman, Sarah from Rutgers, um, who's a Muslim dietitian, and then also, so she presented this medicinal foods uh, in the Quran, 
And I also got some assistance from a Canadian, a Muslim Canadian um, dietitian, and I'll share some of the information they, they shared with me. But this one, this medicinal foods, there are healing foods listed in the Quran that you can consider them you know, the superfoods. So pomegranate, pomegranate is a wonderful food. It's mentioned at least three times in, in the Quran. It has something that I had never heard of until very recently called omega-5. I've heard of omega-3, 6, and 9, but this is something that's very, very helpful for you. <coughs> and um, it's been known, to pomegranates, the studies are showing it even inhibits breast cancer. So try and eat pomegranate, and I don't mean so much the juice, because again, there's a lot of sugar that will come with that. Uh, a little bit is fine, but get the seeds, you know, and if it's a mess, do this trick where you cut it under water, and so all the red juice, you know, you don't get it staining everywhere. But put those seeds on on your, um, you know, your biryani, or put it on top of salads. Um, just have that. It's very, very good for you. Of course, we talked about dates and the the how it's such a good food for for breaking the fast. Figs also very good for you. They're high in um, vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. And it seems like you can find these dried figs year round. Olives, healthy fat, very, very good for the body. Um, wheat is mentioned in the Quran. So I don't know if any of you are experiencing issues with wheat, if you're having gluten issues, but um, it wasn't the case until, you know, recent times because wheat used to be very different, they say. But try, with wheat, corn, and soy, try to get organic for those for sure, okay? Those are the ones that most of the GMOs, the genetically modified food is. Corn and soy, yeah. Actually, for even just looking at organic, I know it can get expensive, but if you look up what's called the Dirty Dozen, you can look up, there's a list called the Dirty Dozen, and then there's the Clean 15. The Dirty Dozen would be the list of 12 of the most contaminated foods, and so you want to make sure you buy those organic. So strawberries, for instance, who's peeling the skin off of the strawberry? You eat the whole strawberry, but so they absorb a lot of the toxins. But a banana, you could peel the banana skin, and so you don't need to have organic for that. Okay, so look up the Dirty Dozen, and you'll know. Okay, beans are wonderful for the body. They're full of fiber. They don't, you know, they don't cause a lot of uh, heaviness in the body. Some gas, but then you can take some digestive enzymes if you're troubled by it. Lentils. Now, sometimes, I should mention about lentils. Uh, sometimes people are, their blood sugar seems to go up a lot with lentils. Uh, so, cause, you know, take a, take a look. If you find that you're borderline getting close to diabetes, you might find that your blood sugar goes really high with lentils, so you want to have a little bit less of that. Okay. Milk, of course. Grapes. And honey. And then pumpkin and squash. Does anyone know what vitamins are really high in orange foods like squash and pumpkin? Do you know? Huh? Well, there's some C, but it's mostly high in A, beta carotene. Think of, they're all the carotenoids, and tomatoes are part of that, and green leafy vegetables are part of that, but if it's got orange color, except for orange, but you're right about the fruit orange, it's definitely very high in vitamin C. But these are the most um, rich in uh, beta carotene. So these are listed, so you want to think, okay, why is this listed? So I should be eating more of that. So instead of worrying about, oh, I shouldn't have this, I shouldn't have this, I shouldn't have that, find first the foods you should have. And by the time you're done eating those, see if there's even room for, for anything else. <laughs> I wanted to mention one more medicinal food <coughs> that I wish I had a slide to show you, but um, black seed. Do you, have you heard of black seed? Yeah, and it's used in, and I saw in, in, it was saying in the Quran, can cure all diseases except death. <laughs> it was said, cures all diseases except death. 
So Black Seed, um, there's a there's a, a person who's put out a bar. Have you have you heard about it? It's called Cure. Has anybody heard of this bar? Cure. Let's see if I have the, the website for it. It's called, so you can go on this website, Cure Your World, CureYourWorld.com. And what it is is a woman. She has her mother used to, grandmother used to make black, use black seed and mix it with superfoods. So basically, foods of the Quran. She has taken that and turned it into a bar. So do take a look at that. Okay. So again, back to you know, breaking of the fast and looking at some of the foods that we want to be eating. Uh, from everything I've been reading and seeing this passage too, the kind of way we were supposed to break the fast is not again stuffing, 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 fast and feast, it's not that. It's supposed to be, like here it says one third food, one third drink or water, and one third space, air so that the food has some place to move around, right? So it's not, and if this is a time of restraint and control, then this is where we want to exercise it too, is during the breaking of the fast. Hmm? So keep that in mind. And I did hear this again from Sarah, the, the person from Red, Rutgers, she said, sometimes the ladies will say it's difficult for us to say no because people keep on saying, oh, just eat hot, hot, you know, food, I've just made it. Come on, eat more, eat more. And so she said, just, you can say that you're following the sunnah of the prophet and not eating too much. So you can always use that as a excuse to not uh, overeat if you feel the pressure to do that. So what shall we eat? So I mentioned that the Canadian dietitian, he had created a sample meal plan for us. So he was saying to use the dates soaked in a, in a cup of milk or a small soup uh, at the break. Now, of course, the timing is different because he's in Toronto. So it may be that I think you, that that will be earlier, hopefully, uh, for us here. Then he said, stop and go complete the sunset prayer. So now you've had a chance for the sugar to go into the system so you can kind of calm your system down a little bit, then go do the prayer, then come back and have the main meal, okay? And, and try some of, like he has a meal plan here. He actually has a seven-day meal plan he, he shared with me. So then have a snack again. You can have another snack. Um, and he has, you know, a couple of them, so that they're going on, a little bit, little bit of food is going in the system. And his suggestion was also to prepare the breakfast if you're going to eat it. Either somebody will s skip it entirely and sleep through, or they will, uh, the recommendation is to prepare it in advance uh, so that you can maximize your sleep. And then you can have Sahur and stay up. Okay. And then Sarah shared this lentil soup recipe. Looks very tasty, very rich in the garlic. So. And if you don't have an instant pot, that is the most wonderful tool. I don't know. Does anybody know what I'm talking about, instant pot? Uh, it's a pot that you can soak your beans. You don't have to do an overnight soak. It's lovely. You can put all of that in the pot, and then um, within 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you get proper soft beans, soft garbanzo beans. Everything is nice and tender. Meats, you can cook very quickly. <coughs> and so you can put, the best part is, you can put a lot of vegetables in it, and if you use that immersion blender, you know, blend it up, you can really get a lot more vegetables in your diet that way. A lot of people tell me they're eating much healthier now that they have this pot. 
So it's really just an electric pressure cooker, essentially, but it's safe. If you've heard those horror stories of pressure cookers opening up and the, you know, it exploded on some, everybody has one story of burns, this, this will prevent any of that. And then my friend had made me some boladi, my friend Wajma. She said, instead of these heavy parathas, I make boladi. And do you want to see the recipe? But she don't use the yeast, so skip the yeast. And um, don't, she doesn't use oil.
to mention I'm passing around a clipboard. I have a monthly newsletter that I put out that has articles, it has recipes, it has news and tips and things like that. So if you want to be on it, it's only once a month it comes out. Just really targeting the local area and um, different physicians and people are writing in articles. So please uh, feel free to sign up. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to point out is there are some different things that happen during Ramadan that you might be experiencing and you want to kind of preemptively start to think about what am I going to do. So for instance, um, you know, having a little bit of indigestion. Sometimes people are feeling a little bit of reflux. So reflux, you know, where the acid starts to rise a little bit. Perhaps eating too soon next, you know, right before going to sleep might aggravate that. So consider maybe giving yourself a little space before you go to sleep. Um, and then one of the suggestions was mint tea if you're having kind of any kind of digestive issues, so that can help. You know, even though they say mint tea, I also in Ayurveda we we have what's called CCFT, cumin, coriander, and fennel. And you could mix those things with hot water and use, make a tea out of that. And that's very good for digestion. As is the spice, we call it bajuan. It's um, caraway seeds. Yeah, it's very good for digestion. Constipation. Sometimes people feel constipation because they're not eating that much. The digestive tract has slowed down. So remember, a lot more fiber will help push things along, and water. You need both, not just the fiber. You have to have enough water, and that'll help. And then headaches come sometimes just because of the water. You know, it's usually dehydration. But if one is, is really experiencing headaches, a lot more headaches, you can consider taking magnesium, magnesium at night before going to sleep, can help to headaches. So I wanted to set aside time for questions, if you had any questions, uh, anything really fasting. Yeah. On the last slide, mm -hmm. the first point, drink liquid with meal. Avoiding drinking liquids with, uh, with meals. So they're saying for indigestion, if you're having digestive problems, maybe drink the liquid in between. Them. You're going to take a sip, but not a lot of water. Yeah. Is that just during the fasting or in general? It's just in general, you know, they're saying it, but they're, yeah, they put that in for survival during this time. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> oh, okay, go ahead. So how about tea? Like, is tea healthy? Or? Tea? Uh -huh. Tea is fine. Not black tea, the chai. Oh, chai? Yeah, sure. It, you know, it, it, if there's a lot of caffeine going in, then that's dehydrating. You must compensate by having more water. But chai is fine. If you're having one cup or even, you know, one and a half cups, then just drink plenty of water to go with it. I think it's fine. Yeah. So in terms of uh, the headache, all of us... For the first week, we all get into that mode like every morning our head is hurting. So you recommend taking magnesium and sulfur, you said? Uh, at night is good for you'll get good sleep. Magnesium glycinate is very good for mm -hmm. that form. You can get it, yeah. Um, magnesium glycinate, or you can get what's called chelated magnesium. Um, and I can share with you the link for that. It's very good for, yeah, particularly people who are having more headaches even during the rest of the year. But see, your body is so used to using glucose for the brain, and it craves it the first few days. The headaches are probably intense just because your blood sugar is just off. But, um, yeah, hopefully that subsides over time. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, honestly, water, yeah, the in between the meals, even in Ayurveda, they say just have a sip, and, but not lots of water with the meal. 
uh, because you're really trying to keep the what we call the digestive fire strong, right? Um, but in between, it should be fine. Uh, to pro yeah, so we, what I was saying about having that strong, you want that strong digestive fire, you don't want to cool it. Um, and the other thing is you consider using, um, drinking warm water. Yeah, and I don't mean hot from the tap. I mean like use the kettle and, and boil water and then keep and sip warm water throughout the day. So your body, it just it, it accommodates that more than cold, cold. Yeah, mm -hmm. again, for that digestive power to be strong. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, um, during the course of Ramadan, um, we tend to eat um, low food. Like we just we get only certain windows to eat food, and mostly after um, mother time. So, um, unfortunately, the behavior just turns into it that you try to eat as much as you can yeah. to survive for the next day. Right. So, um, I know normal course of a day we eat small portions to keep ourselves healthy, mm -hmm. but at a sudden our body starts like uh, e eating so much food. So how we can stop our behavior not to eat so much food and yeah. that one window that, that we come? Because at summer we really don't eat that much. We try mm -hmm. to eat cereal and like, but that's the only window we try to eat the most protein and everything mm -hmm. we want to dump in ourselves. So yeah. And that's why this whole discussion about fasting and looking at it from a, a different perspective before you start say, this is how I want it to be. I want to break my fast with healthy foods. I don't want to overindulge because ultimately people can fast without any food. They need water for sure, but they can go for days and days as we have before refrigerators were ever there. We used to hunt and have, you know, eat and then go days sometimes because there was nothing as long as you're hydrated um, and people are doing that and finding chronic disease management and coming from that so with so much effort of fasting you have to think why would I want to mess it up by just indulging so much in that scarcity mindset that there's not going to be any more food and even then your stomach is starting to shrink right because you're not eating so it really can't handle that much food as we're trying to force force it on, right? And another thing to consider, because of the circadian rhythm, and we do follow that rhythm, and feel sleepy at night, so there's a hormone, melatonin, it makes you sleepy, right, at nighttime. It causes also a little insulin resistance, so you're not really absorbing the same way as you would in the morning, in the daytime hours, the food, because that's the window of time you normally are eating, and it's the most robust and you're going to digest and you're um, you're going to absorb the best. Nighttime, the absorption starts to go down naturally. So keep that in mind that it's, from from what I've read, it's it's lighter meals that are, it's, it, it's not supposed to be very heavy on the say, taxing to go to sleep with a really heavy full stomach anyway. Yeah. That was my next question. Um, so what is the time for your well, you do need to get sleep, and right, and you have to eat. And I know that because of that, and it looks like because of the window of time, I'm seeing even on Muhammad's, uh, you know, my sample meal plan that he gave, he's still eating at 11:30. Um, again, it, you do the best you can with the time that you have. So on on a regular day, um, you would not want to do that. You would want to give yourself at least a two-hour window before you, um, you know, before you go to sleep. So, yeah. Exercise? So one suggestion was that because the energy is really low by then, some people, after they do the dates and the milk and then have that initial break, uh, and their prayers. Sometimes what they do is a little yoga or some gentle movement, tai chi, that kind of exercise that's lighter. Um, and then they have their, or they do it after the main meal, where they have enough energy now. Come, it's come from the food. That's the best time. It's just you set yourself up for failure trying to do things on a very weak, tired 
body. And remember, metabolism slows down. You don't eat as much, and you're very sedentary, it slows down. So keep in mind what's, what's reasonable for, what's sensible, what feels right. Probably after the meal. Even go for a light walk, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did my clipboard make it around? Yeah? Okay. Any other nutrition questions? I do. I do. Yeah. So you talked about um, sleeping and also meditating. I do. Um, I do. Outside Ramadan, I mean, sometimes you just like I know when you tend to take the meditating tablet to get yeah. back to sleep. Right. Do you have any you can do that for sure. It's, it's uh, very good at helping with jet lag. Um, lately, though, even fasting has been known to be more helpful at jet lag. Hard to do, but it's fasting for the flight until you get into that time zone. You get water only, then you enter that time zone and then you eat. And so it resets your clock. Yeah. It's so much easier to pop than the melatonin tablet, of course. Yeah. Yes. I do. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you inviting me here to talk. Yeah. And um, anybody that wants to get uh, my I can have my cards if you wanted to talk for the future. So. All right. Yeah. I do. Uh, I'm pregnant. Uh, my due date is in the Ramadan. Uh -huh. So I'm. I have planned to fast. Is that safe for me to fast? No, not for pregnant. Pregnant, breastfeeding, it's uh, clearly stated not, not to. You want to make sure baby is properly nourished during that time. Yeah. If I ask the doctor, he says if you are taking enough nutrition in the night time, so you can do it in daytime. This, oh. I know the study time is very long, like a 15 days, 15 to 16 days. Yeah. Just take 15 to 16 hours, but still I'm really wanting I wanted to. Wanted to. Yeah. Well, that's what it says in the Quran too, right? Okay. Pregnant. You you can talk some more with your doctor about that, but I would recommend not. Or maybe maybe you want to do part of it. Uh, but the full day might be a little, a little bit much for pregnancy, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.